Chris Swick here, your host from the depths of darkness to the light of success. This podcast is powered by my sponsors, Ellis Original and Cloud9 Media. Today I got some great guests from Denver, Colorado, Ralph de Quebec and Jose Lugo. Would you mind giving the audience a little bit rundown about yourselves, guys? First with Jose. My name's Jose Lugo. Um, I'm currently a co-founder of uh, We Are All One Story. What I do full time is I travel the United States and I hear uh, people's stories and I share them through social media and uh, on our website at WeAreAllOneStory.com and our YouTube channel uh, at We Are All One Story. Nice and Ralph. Uh, my name is Ralph De Quebec. I'm a retired Marine of 14 years. Um, I'm a Paralympic gold medalist, 2018 Korea. I'm also a co-founder of We Are All One Story. Um, more of like the visual representation and, and just the, out, the outreach. Nice. So guys, take us back to your childhood a little bit. So whereabouts did you guys grow up then? Uh, growing up in the, the harbor area of Los Angeles, so San Pedro, Wilmington, Long Beach. Okay, so you got, that's where your whole family grew up then. What was uh, your relationship like with your guys' family and stuff like that growing up? Were you guys the only two siblings or was there more? Yeah, so, so the, the way me and Ralph are brothers is that he was my sister's boyfriend for about 15 years. So <laughs> okay, sorry, yeah, sir. <laughs> so we both grew up in the harbor area of Los Angeles. Um, okay. And we both have somewhat similar experiences in our childhood with, um, you know, both of us not having a, a father in our lives. And uh, we both um, uh, took different routes in our lives. He joined the military and I joined a gang. Um, but throughout our lives, uh, we stayed connected and um, we, kept that, we kept that bond of brotherhood going. And, you know, we're, my family and his family are very tight. So and, when did you guys first meet then when Ralph was dating your sister? I must have been like, 13? 13. Okay. <laughs> I was like 16. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, so you, oh, you're the younger of them, Jose. Yeah, I know <laughs> I look older. <laughs> <laughs> ah, you both look my face, so I took off my ears. <laughs> so what was it like growing up then? You guys, you said without fathers and stuff like that. Was it a single mother household then? What was that like growing up in the Los Angeles area and stuff like that? I mean, I think uh, Ralph can talk about his unique experience okay. and I'll, I'll talk about my For sure, thank you. You know, like uh, my biological father left when I was about five years old. And then so uh, my mom eventually had uh, two girls from two different guys. And the last one, Thomas, ended up being my stepfather, who I call father now. Um, you know, growing up, he taught me a lot about discipline and what was right from wrong. So a lot of that imparted in who I am today. Um, my relationship with my mother is, is, is pretty good. She's strict. Um, you know, she's demanding, she's also very loving, and she's always very, uh, also very supportive. So I've always had the support in whatever that I wanted to do. And then I had the work ethic instilled by my father to know that I can accomplish whatever I did as long as I worked really hard. So that was pretty much my general childhood is, you know, just work really hard, keep on the straight and narrow and, and try to accomplish whatever I put my mind to. Yeah, so like basically so was, things don't just get handed to you, you got to work for them and stuff like that. Right, right. And especially coming from where we're from, we don't come from a whole lot. And so, you know, when they say you come from the bottom, like, that's literally what it feels like when you're growing up. And, you know, you're uh, sometimes you go to sleep hungry and sometimes you got to change your route because, you know, you got older gangbangers watching you get off the bus from yeah. high school. You know what I mean? And, and so, um, you know, it's a little rough, but it, I think that's what may puts that little that chip on your shoulder, a little rough around the edges mentality and that helps you persevere through a lot of adversity um throughout life nice. and how about you jose do you have a specific question about uh my child or do we, i or, just get a like, what was your relationship like then I, you said you grew up without a father and stuff like that as well what was your relationship like with your mother and stuff like that growing up like where did the gang start like come into play i guess was that your <sighs> teens yeah i mean my relationship with my mother was, uh, is, is, you know, it's complex. It's hard to describe. She had to fill the shoes of an absent father and she had six of us. Um, so in that, I mean, uh, my mom was a strict disciplinarian, meaning, you know, she didn't, you know, she was a-okay with physical discipline and that naturally makes me as a kid and, you know, into teens, like, you know, I ended up building a wall. 
Yeah, like a um, wall for just put up in front of everyone sort of thing, eh? Like in front of, yeah, and it started with putting the wall inside of, you know, as a kid inside the household. Um, so my, my relationship with her is, um, it's great as far as me knowing all the things she did, but emotionally, like, there's still, you know, strains there. Um, to this day? I mean, I've, to this day, yeah, because, like, now getting older, um, I visit my mom often, and I do make it a point to have a relationship with her, even, even, like those years of, of, of the emotional roller coaster, that doesn't go away overnight. You know, it's, it's a constant commitment, daily commitment to, you know, work through your emotions. And me being 33, I finally started working on my emotions and my own, um, my own trauma and, and my own life story. So um, I look at my mom and I, I respect her and I'm in awe of her every time I see her. Because going through life as an adult, I see how difficult life is just as a single man. Yeah. Let alone a single mother with six kids. So, um, you know, I'm still in awe of her to this day. But our relationship isn't a cookie cutter relationship at all. It's, it's a very emotionally complex relationship um, that we work through. Um, but all in all, it's, it's a strong relationship given all that still because of those years um that we spent together like uh that bonds you regardless okay that's amazing man so and then you had a couple siblings growing up or just one si you had six sorry so i six yeah siblings. five more so i had yeah. four sisters another brother and ralph would be around <laughs> oh wow ralph would be hanging around too <laughs> nice. quite, around. quite a busy household then so whereabouts, like in Los Angeles, is this then, like, as opposed to like right downtown, I guess, Los Angeles? No, the coastal city of Los Angeles. It's right oh, okay. across from Long Beach. So it's the port. We lived in the port of Los Angeles. So oh, okay, okay. Yeah, Just trying to get a picture here. Okay. City by the sea. Yeah. The city by the sea. <laughs> that makes sense now. <laughs> nice. So what, so what instance did you like really like the gang lifestyle then there, Jose? Like you said, you grew up a gangbanger and stuff like that until you are where you are today so yeah i grew up a, generally a good kid <laughs> <laughs> well, not a gang, sorry not a gang banger but like what instance like did you make that switch that you like that lifestyle yeah, i guess i think like, that i think that um you know as a kid without a father you you have a natural yearning for that male figure okay um and I didn't join. I didn't. I didn't join the gang till I was older, sixteen. That's old because there's kids who are 12, part 13. of that lifestyle, eleven, twelve, thirteen years old. And you know, I went yeah. in act older. Sixteen is older in in that lifestyle. So, but you know, I was just drawn to it. I mean, I hated being home. One, um, uh, I felt that what the gang offered was in its own sense, a form of love. So you felt uh, a part of, of something, finally part of love, sort of thing. Longing, something bigger than myself. Um, and the violent factor of being part of a gang. I mean, I knew that growing up, so it wasn't foreign to me and it just felt in its own way. It felt, um, I thought that's what love was and it takes a long time to figure out what love is. Okay, and then grow, so you started at 16. Did you like drop out of high school then? Start no, no, no. School? I, no. I, I did play football in high school, and you know, by the grace of God, that's what got me my high school diploma because of my because of my uh, <laughs> uh, so you two went to the same high school because yeah. I read that Ralph also played did track and football and stuff like that. And you, yeah, you seemed to excel in that in some of the articles I was reading and stuff about your Ralph, yes, sir. Yeah, so what did you do in track then? What, what did you uh, back in the day i uh i was a relay member in the four by one i did the shot put in the pole vault um sometimes the four by four um really it was just to stay in conditioning for football and you know work work on um, speed and stuff like that and just really be around other students after school because like i didn't want to go home either yeah you just wanted to be you did because you didn't like the home lifestyle or you like getting out and staying out sort of thing too so that was a yeah. way for you guys to stay out eh yeah, and, and uh, my girlfriend at the time ran, ran track too, so that was another reason to be there. 
<laughs> Watch the ladies too, eh? <laughs> nice. So, and then take us along a little bit. Then you got into the Marines at 19. What pushed you to go to the Marines? Um, I was kind of like in the little rat race that I would call. Um, I was, I, uh, I was working at a bookstore at one college in Long Beach and I was going to community college out in Torrance. And, um, you know, I was running track, trying to make the football team the next year. And I was just kind of in this rat race where it started like six in the morning. I wasn't getting home until like 10, 30, 11 o'clock at night using public transportation. Um, and I just knew it wasn't for me. I, I was, I had that attitude. Like I expected so much more from, from what I was doing and I wasn't getting it. And so, um, uh, September 11th happened, um, and so I was on my way to a study hall at that time, and so, like, as soon as I saw that happen, I just had this, like, urge that I, I, I something was drawing me to that, and sure enough, a couple of days later, a Marine recruiter bumped into me, and I must have had, you know, future Marine stamped on my forehead or something like that, because he said all the right things, and I was gone <laughs> rather quickly. Yeah. And then after that, Jose, were you still going on with the gang when he went the other way to the Marines sort of thing and after he'd gone to college? Um, yeah, you know, I always wanted to join the Marines too. <laughs> <laughs> the funny thing is the deterrent for me was, man, I don't want to get naked in front of all these other men. <laughs> yeah. Part of my language. Can we curse oh, on here? Yeah, yeah. No, not a problem at all. <laughs> yeah. Um, and the, the flip side of that is I ended up going to prison and I had to strip naked for, you know, all the time. So I, that, that was, uh, something in my head all the time. I was, so at what, I, at what age did you end up going to prison at? I went to, I went to prison six months after I graduated high school. I was 18 and a half. And how, and what did you go in for? If you I, went in, I went in for multiple counts of robbery. Okay, and you ended up and you served a lot of time, or how long? Did I you did. Serve? Uh, I served four years out of a five-year sentence. And then you, and was that your last time in prison? Then, and is that when you, you decided? Went, you right, know, unfortunately, I had enough of this shit. Unfortunately, I went back for a DUI, and I went back for uh, which was this past would have been what? How long ago was that? A year. Two and, maybe two and a half years ago and that's when I said you know I had always vowed to myself that if I were to ever come back to jail it would be for something pertaining to my family and not for some stupid shit and I was in jail for a DUI and it fucking broke my spirit you know like uh and then I began to change my life after that so you were were you heavily addicted to drugs alcohol too at this point in this mostly gasoline? alcohol okay yeah, yeah just alcohol yeah, yeah. And were you into dealing drugs or anything while you were in this gang and stuff like that, or? No, you know, I think the the I was always more into the um, just like uh, I was a part of those things, but I was never like I never liked uh, you know I never really gave my all to to that aspect of being part of a gang, even though it was available to me. It just wasn't it wasn't for me. I definitely liked the. Um, more the camaraderie part and what that part consists of is usually violence and stuff like that um, and, and you ralph you you did a two three tours over in afghanistan and iraq and then but it all of a sudden came to a halt back in 2012 was it in your last tour in afghanistan there would you like to walk us through that a little bit if you don't mind yeah um so like you said previously i deployed to iraq in 2008 and then uh, Afghanistan in 2010, and on my third deployment in 2012, um, I was a bomb technician by trade. And uh, one day, you know, just happened to be working on a device in the middle of the night, and, um, and one of my members from my element and eventually walked back down where I was, and he actually functioned the device. And so once the device went off, it catapulted him into a river. Um, it threw me up against the wall knocked me um knocked all the wind out of me and so and next thing i know i'm laying in a shot hole um where the explosion created so it knocked all the dirt out displaced all the dirt and i'm sitting crater, that name that crater yeah and so i'm sitting in this crater and i could see the smoke billowing and whatnot and i remember trying to kick out of the hole and i just couldn't and so um my teammate and my uh my my doc on my team came and they pulled me out of this crater like i was a rag doll like it was just Oh, like wow. effortlessly 
Yeah. And they, they dragged me for about 20 to 30 meters where they started performing all the life, life uh, saving steps and whatnot. And so I just remember there, you know, um, laying in the ground, having trouble breathing, um, just trying to fight for dear life at that point, you know, just running through mental inventory of like telling myself that I wasn't done living the life that I had wanted to live. There were so many things that I wanted to do with my loved ones. And, and um, there was just, uh, I just wasn't finished. And I just remember, you know, laying on the ground, like tell, talking to God and telling him like, don't make my life end this way. Um, and uh, like, if he didn't, like I'd promise to, to fulfill whatever it was that he wanted me to fulfill. Um, and so, yeah, that was uh, June, June 22nd, uh, 2012. And so um, that day probably just sits in the back of your head. Eh? It just, do you ever want to like, wish you could be back in the Marines? Oh, um, like to I this mean, day or? I mean, you know, I, I, as soon as I joined the Marines after my first four years, like I wanted to get out after my first three years, I wanted to get out. I just, it what was, it wanted you to get out? What wanted um, you? I just wasn't at my first three years. I didn't participate in the war as okay. I wanted to. Like I wanted to go to combat, you know, get tested. Um, you know, a level of the, the level of camaraderie that you develop while you're in combat is unparalleled to anything else because you're dealing with life and death situations. And so the bonds you make between life and death situations are, are created for life. You know what I mean? Yeah. So I knew that. And without going to combat, like I just didn't feel like I was fulfilling those those um those things that I wanted out of life and so um like I wanted to get out and then I made the transition into becoming a bomb technician and since then like I never wanted to turn back because every situation you're in pretty much is life and death and so I guess with um, what you're doing yeah because you, and, and were you a bomb technician in all three of the tours you did correct correct and so you know the gravity of training is is immense you know level of communication the level of trust uh leadership all those things all the little finite skills and all the little um, 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 intangibles, they, they come into play when you're dealing with life and death situations on a daily basis. And so I crave that. And so once I got a little taste of that, um, that gravity of, of trying to become a better person just drew me into it. And so to this day, like if I could be, I'd be a Marine, you know, out on the front lines. Um, but yeah. And then so after that whole incident, you were flown to Germany with multiple surgeries and stuff like that. And yeah. then you were flown back to the States. Was it Denver you came back to or where was no, it? No, I went to uh, Washington, D.C., the Bethesda, Maryland area. Um, okay. Walter Reed, the military medical hospital. It was Walter Reed. That's where all the uh, wounded warriors are getting transferred to. And, and, you know, at that time, there was a lot of wounded warriors there. I must have been with another you know, 30 to 40 amputees, you know, I'm a bilateral yeah. amputee above the knee. And so a lot of my friends are bilateral amputees above the knee, you know, they're missing their legs. Yeah. Um, and so that was also another environment that that created a level of competition, a lot, a level of a spirit of core, a level of camaraderie that, you know, we all went through. Um, was there lots of egos there? Oh, extreme egos, you know, but I think that's what draws, that's what draws, um, um, guys to the highest level of overcoming what they just went through. You know, yeah, I, had Navy for sure. SEALs. I had friends that were Navy SEALs, friends that were Rangers, friends that were um, ODA, you know, uh, recon, um, you know, EOD, all these like elite guys. And so they have this mentality where, you know, yesterday, the, the only bad day was yesterday. And so you have to make what you're going to do with today. And so um, that literally throws you into the fire when you're going through recovery. And so you either sink or swim. And I was just lucky enough to be around enough solid people that I can consider my recovery team. And we kind of pushed each other. <coughs> and so, um, and so that, that level of competition is, is what's always been drawn to me. So even during recovery, I was drawn. If a guy was walking better than me, I was like, I need to walk better than that guy. The guy spending more time in the, in the in the military advanced training center then i want to spend more time yeah um, doing what i need to get better so just got to be the the best guy is what you wanted to be eh? right right the best version of you i guess is the best way to exactly. put it and that's what it comes down to at the end of the day like yeah like i'm looking at the competition of the other guys but i'm really trying to create a, a mindset of inner competition because at the end of the day i compete with myself and no one can compete with me 
for sure. That's awesome. And there was, sounds like there was lots of dark times after this had all happened over in Afghanistan and stuff like that. Like you had depression. Did you have PTSD? Oh. Like, can you walk us through some of that and talk us around the stigmas around that and stuff like right. that? Right. So, you know, we talked a little bit about, you know, me losing my legs and, you know, uh, if I walk on a stage or I walk into a bar or I walk into a rink or whatnot, the first thing people are going to notice is that I don't have legs. Yeah. And so automatically they, they can see that, okay, this guy has been through something, but what most people don't understand is that I've been through a lot worse than just losing my legs. Yeah. I lost a teammate um, uh, a month before I got blown up. And so, you know, that was the most difficult time that I had to go through. Um, you know, that was a very humbling experience. Um, at that time, you know, I was on top of the world. I, like I said, I was on my third deployment. We were rocking and rolling having the best time of our lives and, and, you know, something like that, that wrench gets thrown into your, your gears and you don't know what the fuck you're going to go do. And go this guy was a really close friend of yours as well, eh? Yeah. JP Yulin, you know, he checked into my unit and he was uh, fresh out of school. And so I was pretty sal uh, saltier with what you would consider, you know, I, I, I was familiar with the ropes. Yeah. And so they stuck the new guy with me and, and, you know, I trained him as much as possible in the, in the first, you know, three months that I knew him four months that I knew him. And so he was ready to go. And so, um, unfortunately, um, he was killed what they call a green on blue incident. And, and ironically, more people die in combat from green, green on blue incidents than they do from getting killed by the Taliban. And what's a green on blue? So the audience knows, um, a green on blue incident is, is where, um, a member of the Taliban defects, and then they and then they 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 work their way into the, either the Afghan National Army, Afghan National Police, Iraqi Police, Iraqi National Army, and they go through the whole setup. And so they go through boot camp. They learn how to shoot. They do the whole nine. And so they become part of a unit, and they're embedded. They could work. This guy that was apparently that that committed this act, um, he had been with this unit for two years already. So this everybody that was in that unit had a level of comfortability with him, and and thought yeah. that. You know, he was part of the team and so that guy eventually got the ta the call by um the taliban commander and and he said you know do your do your thing and so that's what he that's what happened he okay so he army. was basically undercover in one of those armies then and stuff yeah he was dressed like us he looked like us he had our radios he had an m16 that was probably given to him from oh, us wow. um and so you know being like being a lazy being a lazy fighter you know the only reason why he didn't kill all of us is because his weapon jam yeah and well, so that must had, have been a really had, scary had, incident for all of you then at that point. Oh, for sure. I mean, a uh, muzzle flash is flying, you know, five feet away from your face. You know, you'll, those images you'll never you'll forget ever. And then, so how was rehabbing then? How did that go for you? Like, it must have been tough when it first started out and stuff like that. Uh, well, yeah, rehabbing. that's where a lot of the depression and, you know, the suicidal thoughts, the PTSD, all that kind of stuff, um, you know, just gets magnified because like I said, you know, when you're sitting on top of the world and it comes crashing down, you know, you go through identity crisis and you don't know where you're going to be, who you're going to be, what you want to be. And you got to really start all over yeah. from not from scratch. You got to start from a subsurface level because now you don't even know how to walk. Yeah. Cause and now you got to add legs that are prosthetic and then stuff like that and learn how to right. use so all those, all those um, other obstacles that, that I had no idea about, you know, waking up, telling myself like, oh, you got to throw your legs on just to get on throughout the day or, you know, addressing people from a wheelchair or, you know, having to ask for help um, when I wasn't used to asking for help. Um, so all those things, you know, played a big role in depression. And so, you know, um, that's, that's kind of like a, what pulled me out is when I discovered sled hockey. Okay. It was another environment that, that created that level of competition, a level of camaraderie, and, you know. So who introduced sledge hockey to you? How did you come into contact with sledge hockey? Uh, at that time, I had been, you know, just doing my thing for about a year, you know, just faking it, faking the funk, you know, people asking me, like, are you all right? Everything's all good. So I played that that face and threw that mask on for about a year. Yeah, I remember doing that, too, as a uh, in active addiction myself, too. Like, are you okay? You know, yeah, I'm okay. You know, I basically just whim by, you know, the day and stuff like that. But really, I'm not okay deep down inside. Like, that's when I came clean and got clean back last year again is when all those feelings really started coming out. My mental health issues and stuff and depression, anxiety, 
because I was just burying it with all these drugs, cocaine, crack, all those things over the years, you know, I, and it all stemmed back to an incident with a family friend, myself personally too. Like it was a, someone did something that was my age. We were 10 years old and did something to me. Another guy did another boy. And that's where my addiction really stems from. And I only came clean about that last November when I got clean again. So, you know, but it really makes a world of a difference just talking about things every day, like you're saying and stuff like that. For sure. For sure. And so, um, you know, while I was going through that whole thing, uh, I knew that I had to develop a routine. Like I've always, you know, whenever I find myself in dif difficult situations, the first thing I got to do is develop a routine and challenge myself. And so um, at that time, I had tried all the other d uh, adaptive sports and nothing just really caught me. You know, nothing was physical. Nothing was extremely challenging. Um, and so I had been lifting weights and walking through the weight room and one of the guys from the hockey team came up and was like yo you should try hockey is this at the hospital that you were rehabbing uh, yeah, at? Okay. yeah at the hospital and I looked at him in the face and you know he's a 200 pound black guy <laughs> and uh, I looked at him and I was like you gotta be fucking kidding me like hockey <laughs> like I'm from LA we don't play those sports we play you know <laughs> All the poor sports, you know, the basketball, <laughs> football, baseball. The poor sports. You know, the they stuff. All, you, you, those ones are all make more point. money than hockey players, though. <laughs> right? Yeah, they are. <laughs> they true. But it only costs $20, and you have endless yeah. amounts of, 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 you know, training going on. And so um, I told him no for about a week, and so I was married at that time. And so he kept harassing my wife and my sister and me. And finally my wife was like, you know what, just get this guy off our back and, and go out there and play hockey. <laughs> So that's how it all began. Eh? That's how it all started. And so the first time I went out, um, I, didn't, I didn't really like it. I was like, this is probably a little too hard for me. I didn't understand it. The second time I went out, I had a guy, um, his name was Doyle, uh, Mike Doyle. And uh, he took extra time. He lived in Philadelphia and he would drive from Philadelphia to DC and he would come down an extra day. Oh, that's and amazing. Literally, yeah. And he would Set literally. Time aside just for you just for me and he would go because he knew I was going to set the time aside to go to the rink and try to work on all the little basic stuff and so he did that for about two months and then I was able to pick up the amounts of the game to where I was I, I was in love with it by then and you couldn't get me off the ice <laughs> you, you like I tell my son he eats sleeps and shits hockey now my son does yeah, <laughs> exactly exactly it's a full-time job <laughs> yeah yeah and it sounds like you came part of this program called the USA Warriors. I did. What, what is that? Um, the USA Warriors is a program out of DC and they facilitate hockey for all the wounded warriors that are in that area. And so, like I said, at that time we had probably. You know, so it's group. just military personnel that are a part of this team? Yes, we had. So when I first started, it, it started as a military organization, but we had a couple civilians because we didn't have enough players to play. Okay. Um, and so a couple of civilians came out and Noah Grove happened to be one of those civilians. And he was 13, 14 at the time. And he plays on the national team with me right now. Wow. He's turning 21. So I've known him for the last seven years and I played hockey with him for the last seven years. Um, but yeah, so they, they, they pretty much facilitate all the hockey needs that we have. They pay for travel. They pay for um, ice time. They pay for everything. I never had to worry about one thing. Um, when it was come when it came to hockey, you know, they facilitated early ice times and all that equipment and all that kind of stuff. So I was just blessed from the beginning that if I wanted to put in the work, someone was going to help me. All right, thank you, man. Well, maybe we'll get a little word out of Jose over there. He's sitting quietly. <laughs> no. So, what instance in your life do you really felt that you started battling your alcoholism and stuff like that? Your battle with alcohol. When did you start like uh, really getting into the boozing and stuff like that? As soon as I got out of prison, when I started drinking. Okay, you didn't really drink before that, eh? In your teens, sort of. I mean, or? I went. I mean, I drank in high school, and I had all the red flags of alcoholic because I would drink till I pass out. But you yeah. know, they, you know, apparently that's you know that's normal too, though. <laughs> you know, you're growing up. But um, yeah, yeah. Um, I also didn't. When I got out of uh, uh, prison, I was I went back to LA for a year and a half. And then Where did I went, you serve your sentence, if you don't mind me asking? Sentinel State Prison in California. Oh, okay. On the uh, level four maximum security yard. Um, you know, I didn't really know. I knew abstractly that I had a drinking problem, but I think like um, 
I never came to grips with how serious it was until I just started seeing it just tearing my life apart. Like uh, there was no ignoring it. Um, and it had to reach that point in order for me to actually admit to myself um, that I was pretty much wanting to end my life in a faster way. That's the way I was drinking. I was drinking every day. I mean, Ralph was here. I mean, yeah. uh, he was a witness to that. And it was just a, a roller coaster that was coming off the rails. Um, chaos and insanity. Well, exactly. that's, how, that's how I know it as an, an addict myself too. So yeah. Yeah. So, it was. and like, would you say you were dealing with demons though? Like, that were deeper down that you didn't want to, you know, address or anything. Is that why you? Yeah, of course. Alcohol. Of course. of course, that's exactly what it was. Um, so what were some of those demons and things you were battling? You know, I think, like you said, a lot of it stems from my youth, and I think that, um, you know, when you start numbing yourself as as a kid, and then that becomes the norm almost as an adult. And I didn't even know it. Like I just experienced life like melancholy. Like I didn't have a, the full range of emotions, you know? And, um, Oh, for sure. I know that all too well too. Like only these last few months, I've really been getting lots of these emotions and being able to be yeah. happy, you know, and feel <laughs> exactly. those emotions, happy, exactly. sad, crying yeah. for the first time. In I don't know how many fucking years. So. Yeah. <laughs> crying, not lit. You know what I mean? Crying, just, just. And actually feel it. And actually yeah, and not like that, like uh, that drunk, you know, like a somber cry, you know, like yeah. trying to get a piece out, you know, just make someone feel sorry for, you know, I genuinely cry a lot. Like I'll yeah. be watching a movie and that's actually heartwarming, you know. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's great though now, like. It is great. I feel like, um, you know, facing the demons. I mean, demons per se. I mean, it's just, I wouldn't even call it demons at this point. Okay. It's, just, it's just confronting my life experiences and being able to process them in a form that makes sense to me. And, and, and so do you of, write these things out, like all these experiences yeah, you had, like yeah. journal and stuff like that? I, man, I have books and books of journaling. I write every day. Well, same with me, man. Like I, I wake up in the morning and write my goal out. You know, my goal changes all the time because here yeah. I am now doing my podcast and stuff like that. You know, that was my last goal, and here I am doing it now. Yeah, and congratulations I'm down the road. But I just write them as they're happening, you know, and yeah. as if I've already done them. That's how I attain my goals these days, man. That's how my man, mentor said he's like, write it like you're actually you've already done it. And yeah, that's write that yeah, out that's every crazy. day, man. Yeah, yeah, so, I do that. Yeah, I do it every day. It's pretty consistent. Um. And that really helps. I, I write out what my thoughts are. It's like, you know, with the anxiety, you have like a zillion thoughts that just coming at you. And then if I sit down and I can focus all those thoughts into um, a cohesive thought, you know, that really helps me a lot. Um, but yeah, it's pretty much just, you know, living life, knowing that these emotions are normal that being it's okay to feel and and understanding that it's normal and that it's actually to be numb that's where you don't want to be um you know and i actually yeah i feel like i'm getting a chance to experience life like i'm supposed to with the full range of emotions nice yeah like i see you having like doing great on your uh, instagram page and i see like is, is that your little daughter that you have or is that is that a little girl that you always I see on, on your posts on Instagram and stuff like that. Which one? What well, on my personal Instagram? Yeah, your personal Instagram. Like, see no, those Instagram. are my nieces. Those are my okay. nieces. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. But, but yeah, you like, you seem so full of life though, as a, as opposed to when you first started out, you know, in the gang and stuff. That you're full of life again, which is awesome. It's yeah, it's crazy. I mean, if you go through my pictures, I'm not smiling in any of them. <laughs> Pre recovery, there's no smile in any of my pictures. No, no, for sure. That's what I mean. Like I see, like the I'm that mean motherfucker. You know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. It changed. You know, I feel like uh, you know having that persona. I mean, growing up as a kid, I don't know what my identity is, and I found my identity through the gang and within that culture. I mean. You don't smile in pictures. You're a hard ass. You don't show emotion, and yeah. eventually those things lead you up for a catastrophic failure. And um, it's so true, man. Like, yeah, if you don't like, that's not 
that won't let, like I tell my friends when I go back home, I tell them, you know, all the stuff you learn in a gang, that's not going to help you live long. It may, it may have helped you survive in that moment, but in the end, it's going to come and get you. And you got to let that shit go. You got to let yeah, the you, pride you go. You may be street speaking. smart, but you're not book smart, you know, or, yeah. or just like have that knowledge. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I've I've hung out with lots of gang members in my youth too and stuff like that. And I, I thought it was cool myself too. Like so, you know, I'm glad I got out of it when I did. Like when two guys I knew went to went to jail for first degree murder, I was like, you know, enough's enough of this stuff. Yeah. So, you know, it was enough's enough of that, you know. So take us to, now a little head with a we are all of one story. What's that all about, guys? You the two year founders of it, it sounds like. So Yeah, I mean, um, it's essentially our story. I mean, um, I think uh, me and Ralph both went through our, I mean, what I would say deep depression. He went through it in his own way. I went through it in my own way. And, you know, when you're going through a deep depression and you're, and we're, I mean, we're from LA. We don't, I don't know about therapy and I like, I don't even know what's going on. <laughs> I wonder why I'm feeling this way. Um, but I just had this thought, you know, when, when, when the, in the darkest of that depression, I was, you know, the suicidal thoughts of taking my own life is I look back at my life and none of it mattered that I looked at my own story as a person and that it was all bad, that I, I reflected on my own story in the narrative form and it was a failure in, in every way imaginable. And I didn't see any value in my story. Um, Why didn't you see value in it? I mean, that's just, it's just part of the depression. I mean, you know, part of the reason I didn't see value is, um, you know, I, you know, I just thought that I was a bad person and, and that the things I was a part of and the things that, um, I used to be okay with, you know, they were horrible things at the end of the day and that there was no forgiveness for me. Um, but, you know, I'm still here and I was able to see the value in my story again. I was able to look at my life in the narrative form and, you know, mind you what ended up happening, how I got to that point, I cried out to God and he answered and I was finally sorry for all the wrongs I had done. Like when I say sorry, I mean it from the depths of my soul that yeah, like I, the life I had lived, I finally said it was all wrong. And um, so until you admitted that is when that was sort of lifted from you. Eh? Exactly. Once I admitted that my life began to change and I saw, I was able to look at my life and look at it in a positive way and look at it and be like, yo, all these things, what I once thought were bad, I mean, they can turn for good. And the same way I refound the value in my story is what we do with We Are All One Story, that it doesn't matter what you've done, how big or how small you think your story is, that your story has meaning and significance, that your story matters and it's worth telling because I know what it feels like to think that your value is not there that your story is insignificant that's not the case it, each person's story is significant because each person has inherent value as a person therefore their story has just as much value as well for sure it doesn't matter if the guy's a celebrity or the guy was homeless on the streets man everyone's equal in my opinion too like we're all right. human like doesn't matter what race religion whatever we come from it doesn't matter yeah so ralph you want to walk us through a little off topic here, but, you know, I forgot to touch on that too, but on that Paralympic, you know, gold medal run and stuff like that back in 2018, how did that, how did that come about? How did you make the U.S. team there? Um, so, like I said, I started playing hockey in 2013, June of yeah. 2013, so about a year well, that's after. That's pretty quick, right after your uh, injury and stuff like that in Afghanistan, eh? Yeah, but I, like I said, I had a lot of good people around me, like yeah. a lot of guys that gave me everything that I needed. to. All the tools to succeed, they were handed to me. And so um, if anything was going to make me fail, it was going to be myself. Okay. And so I had that, I had that, that thought from the beginning. I, I, in 2014, the team went to Russia and they won a gold medal against Russia. And at that time, I was celebrating my anniversary and I was sitting on a beach having a cocktail, watching the game on TV. And, you know, Did I you knew try I, out for that team. 
I did. And I was still okay. fresh. I was still yeah. extremely fresh to the sport. But the fact that I saw them on national TV and then the fashion that they want and, and, uh, and just all the level of emotions. And you can tell that these guys had been through, you know, hell and back. And then they were able to, uh, you know, just come out on top. At that, at that point in time, at that bar, I said, I'm going to be on that team in 2018. And so um, I just had that ingrained in my head that whatever it took, I was going to be there in 2018. And so, you know, 2015 rolls around. Um, I have a surgery. I can't, I can't try out, but I, I go to a camp before then. And okay. I bust my ass. And so the national team coach is there. And so before that camp started, I said, look, I can't make it to tryouts but I have an opportunity to be in front of this coach for the next three days and I'm going to show him what I have for yeah. the next three days. And so I, that's literally what I did. And so after the third day, he pulled me aside, asked me my story and said, Hey, I want you to come try out. I gave him the spill and said, Hey, I won't be able to. And so, um, cause you were having the surgery. I was having surgery. And okay. so, um, come surgery time, you know, I get a phone call from, uh, one of the managers of the development team and he said, Hey, we want to bring you aboard on the development team. And to myself, I'm thinking, what the fuck? I didn't even try out. Yeah. You know? But obviously, Coach Sauer saw something in that, that at that time. And so he gave him that shot. Um, and so I played on the development team. So I actually got put into an environment where kids had been playing for, you know, it was a younger team, but these guys had been playing for seven to 10 years. And so I was able to learn a lot faster. Uh, playing with those guys. Were they much better than you when you for, oh, when you were out there and some of that? Like with all that day. Night and day. <laughs> I totally fell out of place. You know what I mean? Like these but that guys, must have made you push yourself harder. I'm going to get better just like them. You know what I mean? Like it's not, I mean, and that's the thing. Like a lot of these kids were technically and, and tactically proficient. They knew the ins and outs of the game. But where I can wear them down was going to be with my attitude and my aggression and, and my, and well, my you learned that from the Marines. Eh? <laughs> exactly. Just wear them down, you know, over and over and over and over and over and over and over. And eventually the guy with the hardest head is going to win. And I'm going to bet on myself every time. <laughs> you know what I mean? And so, yeah. um, and so I tried out for two, for the team in 2000, uh, the end of uh, 2016, didn't make it. Um, and then tried again in 2017 and then made it eventually. And so, you know, you go from where guys that are competing at a certain level and then you go to the highest level possible and it's like another switch. It's night and day. Yeah. So, um, well, it's like me watching ju – it's like watching junior hockey, watching the NHL, same thing, but with sledge hockey, though, probably. like Exactly, exactly. And so I, I always equivalent the first time, like me getting on the ice for the very first time is – is like there were sharks in the water and I was here, I was the chum getting thrown in, you know? <laughs> yeah. And you're just going to be patrolling. And so every level that I advanced to, that was what it was like. And so, um, you know, the national team like that was, it was, it was like that. And, but again, the, the, the value and the character of each, of each member of that team, like you don't get there by accident. You know yeah. what I mean? So you take 17 guys that have the same mentality and that are willing to push each other and, and, and willing to give whatever it takes to accomplish a mission, um, there's no greater feeling than that. You know, that level of camaraderie, I mean, you know, it's not a life and death scenario, but to me right now, this is life and death. My dreams are my life and death scenario, you know what I mean? And so yeah. um, I feel like the 16 other guys that are on my team have that same mentality. You know, they're going to go and die for what we want. And, you know, right now the goal is the gold medal in 2022. And so, you know, the work starts now. The work started last year. So are you a part, are you going to be a part of this team or do you have to try out again? The it's next tryouts every day. And I, I mean, okay. it's tryouts, try, tryouts are every day. That's what I'm going to say. Tryouts are every day. Yeah. Um, tryouts are literally, we have to do them every year. Oh, okay. You, know, you have to bring your A game all the time. But like I said, if you don't treat every day as a tryout, you might not make it that, <laughs> that major one. So what um, was it like beating Canada then that um, year? Like winning that gold medal, getting that gold medal put around your, you know, neck, but winning that for your country and stuff. You know, anytime you, anytime you have that kind of rivalry, like I was new to the rivalry. I didn't, I didn't grow up with hockey. But so in sledge know, hockey, I, is it U.S. Canada as well? Like it is with the U.S. Thing, you know, you, you, know you got women's hockey, U.S. Canada, you got men's yeah. hockey, U.S. Canada, you got sledge hockey, men's um, U.S. and Canada. And so, um, and that sledge hockey can get pretty rough from what I, I've watched some games like at my local rinks and stuff. And it looks like it can get pretty rough though and stuff yeah, like the that. Right? Don't give. 
The board's <laughs> yeah, I guess so. And you're rolling <laughs> you know down I mean? ice. The class gives the NHL and all the data. Yeah. Level. The boards don't give. Yeah. I mean, the level of um, the level of hate against each other on the ice is is you can cut it with butter. You know what I mean? I mean, you can cut it with knife. <laughs> it's pretty thick. Yeah. Um, um, but I mean, being able to compete at that level and being down the way we were for the majority of the game and then coming back and, and being able to just, you know, make it happen in 37 seconds and then to win that game in overtime and then to hear the national anthem played and, and you know, just to be surrounded by the guys that you knew went to the depths of where they needed to go in order to make that that position possible you know what I mean and so that was just so rewarding that you know all those early workouts all those times where I told myself it wasn't shit um and pushed myself harder that there were 16 other guys who were pretty much having to do the same and you know and that was the only way that was that was going to become possible um but I love the fact that you know the Canadians were assholes on the ice and at the end of the game we, <laughs> We had the smile on our faces, you know what I mean? Sure, man. That's, that's, that's the amazing feeling in the, about it. You get to take that home with you. you know, no one else can steal that from you ever, that moment. Ever. You know, they say champions walk together forever, <laughs> and that's exactly true. You know what I mean? Like, every single one of those guys on my team will be my brother forever. That's awesome, man. So, what, what is your part in the, your guys' foundation there, Ralph? We are you all know, in the story. You know, for me um, – you know, especially after my situation with getting blown up and playing hockey and, you know, like I said, I walk into a room and people see that I have no legs and they, and they want, they, they immediately want to know what's happened. You know what I mean? Yeah. And so when I'm going through my depressive state, like I really don't want to talk about it. You know what I mean? And so that's what I lost. Want to talk about it you, you feel fine to talk about it today or? Oh, I, I'm totally fine talking about, I was fine talking about it then as well. But I was going through the motions You're when I was talking about it. the PTSD and depression. And right, 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 right. And so, um, like, that's where I lost the value of my story. And so, you know, when people would ask me, hey, we want you to go speak on this or speak on that. We want to hear your story here. We want to hear your story here. And in the back of my head, I was like, why the fuck do you guys want to hear my story? Like, yeah. that, that was literally my emotion at the time. I was like, why do you guys want to hear my story? There's nothing great about it. I literally can do, I literally did what any person can do. And so um, by doing that, like I put limitations on my story and I lost the value of my story. And so I remember, you know, uh, at the time, Carlos was like, hey, I want to push your story to do this, that, and the other. And I had the same inclination. Like, I just, I don't want to do it. Yeah. And, um, and I literally fought back tooth and nail with with anybody that's really ever asked me to tell my story, you know what I mean? Except for like the hockey community. Cause I, I just, you know, or sports illustrated. Yeah. Or sport, those are my people. You know what I mean? Like, you know, I'm giving a sports related article, you know what yeah, I mean? Yeah. So, um, and so, but I just didn't want to do it. And then so when, when Carlos, you know, just told me about his idea that he wanted it to share other other people's stories, I was like, you gotta be fucking kidding me. Like I, I have to be a part of this because this is exactly what I want. I I literally said I want to hear other people's story. Like yeah. I want to hear how they got to where they are because I like I said, I didn't feel like I did anything special to get where I was. And so um I looked at it as as like a learning process to where like I can learn the ins and outs of like the the emotions that other people went through through similar stories and stuff like that. And so I that's how I took it. You know what I mean? There people are explaining how they went through uh, different phases in their life. And so I get firsthand knowledge. I don't got to read a book and, you know, someone's telling me exactly what happened in their life. And so I was in love with the, the concept from the beginning. And so I told him that I would do anything it took for me to help him. And, you know, if that was, you know, me having to go put my face out there and, and to share my story so that people are comfortable sharing their stories and I was going to do that. And, you know, we came up with the idea that I was going to be the first person to share my story. <laughs> How'd that make you feel? <laughs> well, you know, at the time, you know, like there was a lot of pressure at the point, but I, I came to the point where like I had told him, I was like, you know, the story isn't, isn't my story to tell. It's God's story to tell. Okay. And so I took that approach or it was like. Um, so why do you say it was God's story to tell and not yours? Because who the fuck am I to think that, that I did this all on my own? Okay. No, no. Fair enough. 
You know what I mean? Like, yeah. Um, and so the moment that I thought that I wasn't, I wasn't the man that, 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 that you didn't have that ego or I didn't have that ego anymore. Yeah. Like oh, I can tell this story because it was by the grace of God that I'm able to tell it. Um, and so that kind of changed my whole perspective on it. Um, and by telling my story, you know, um, I told him right after the end of the day, like there were some things that I told him that, that interview that I never told anybody. My mom didn't know. Um, I've done articles for, you know, I can't remember his last name for Harry, um, the CBS, I think. I've done interviews with Boomer Sison. I've done interviews oh, with wow. Illustrated. I've done a lot of interviews. And, you know, they're usually the, the normal, you know, I'm going to ask you the general questions. General questions, what happened with your life sort of thing, yeah. Exactly, exactly. And so my brother asked me some questions where I was immediately like, well, shit. Here it goes. Feels, eh? Yeah, you get, you know, and I cried throughout my whole interview. Yeah. Like I said, there was a lot of, a lot of questions that um, I very rarely asked myself. I just doubt that numbed it, you know, um, went to that dark place and, and just muscled through it. And so having to face those emotions head on, you know, that kind of opened up a lot of, it gave me, um, gave me a different lens to look through life at. And so it kind of changed a, a whole lot for me after that. Like I told him, I put my story out there. It, um, it was like a ton of bricks getting like relieved from my pack. And at the same time, since I put it out there, there was no need to be afraid of it anymore because anybody has access to it now. Yeah. And so there's no reason for me to be afraid of, of, of who I was at that point. And, and so um, it was out in, in the environment. So I had nothing to hide at that point. And that was the free, that was, that was the, that was so freeing. The, the level of freedom that was post interview is, is unreal. Yeah. So how many interviews, how many uh, stories have you told to this day, Jose, now? Like, I see quite a bit on your uh, Instagram page where I where we had met. Oh, man, I'm not a numbers guy. I don't no? know. But, like, um, how long have you guys been doing this then, I guess? It's January. So we've been we've been posting people's stories. January 2020? It's January 20th, 2020, yeah. Okay. So we post somebody's story every week, a chapter of six weeks. That's six people. We're at the tail end of chapter two. We start chapter three. Um, so what's each name. different chapter then? Like, is it the same it's thing each chapter? So it's called We Are All One Story. It's just, it's just a, different, a different group of people is the different chapter. Oh, okay, okay. Fair enough. So I'll ask Jose first. What have you done to cope in a positive way with your mental health issues? I don't, I don't even like calling them issues or stigmas and stuff like that, but like with your depression and anxiety and suicidal thoughts, what in a, how have you <laughs> coped with it in a positive way to, today now? Well, I don't really have suicidal thoughts anymore, but yeah. um, in that, like the writing, I got up and I wrote every day. Um, uh, like I said, I was sorry for the things I've done. I think that was really the key component to shift in my mind and in my heart. Uh, I did say I cried out to God. After that, though, the the day-to-day -day that I had to do, that I still do, um, I get up, I write, I gather my thoughts and make them into one cohesive thought instead of them just being everywhere. Yeah. Um, I surround myself with positive people. Um, you know, once, once you, you are who you're around, who you're going to be around all the time. I mean, it's such a For huge, sure. if you surround huh? yourself with the yeah. gang bangers or the negative people, you're going right. to be like that crowd. And uh, I surround myself with the Olympic gold medalists these days. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> so, yeah. surround... so we got one in, we got one in mind for you next, you know, in the summer Olympics, <laughs> you know, I'll be there. I'll be there. <laughs> in Japan, um, but I just, I just, I'm really, I'm really conscious of my mental diet. You know, that's really what I'm super conscious about. I understand that uh, I'm careful what I let into my mind and I am, I am aware of, of my thoughts. Instead of letting my thoughts run rampant, I like to look at them from a, um, like, what do they say? Like looking to a snow globe, you know, like being outside of the thoughts and understand like, whoa, that's a crazy thought, <laughs> you know, <Yeah>. you know, <laughs> but hey let's keep on going about our day yeah but, uh, it's like having a whiteboard in your head you can you write i write yeah. it out first now you know and if that's not a good thing to do we're gonna yeah. fucking erase that right away you know yes so i mean it's just really uh self-awareness is huge understanding that if i'm feeling a certain way 
that one, it's cool to feel that way. Like, cause I, you know, versus being numb, like, man, you know, I'm, I'm glad to walk out and feel and feel good when, you know, just on a beautiful day versus walking out and it being a beautiful day and me being completely oblivious to it. Um, but there's also a flip side, you know, something bad happens or, you know, go through a sad emotion, like knowing that, Hey, when I go to sleep, boom, it, I have a whole new day the next day that, you know, versus when it used to just be uh, benders, tail ends and benders, you know, just, you just go deeper and deeper into the negative thought process and yeah. that, you know, correlates with how you feel. And, you know, I don't have those truly at all because I'm, you know, I'm sober these days, so I can have a bad day, but I know that the next day, Hey, it's going to be pretty, you know, it's, we're not going to continually get worse. So that's amazing, man. Yeah. And what about you, Ralph? How do you, how do you go about coping with like, if these thoughts and stuff like depressive thoughts and feelings and stuff like that, creep up like what do you do to cope with it positive in a positive way um like i'm sure your ptsd does it does it really do you get those flashbacks once in a while sir you got i, that I don't get control? i don't get flashbacks i've never uh, okay. I've only had one negative flashback and you know I, I had to relive um you know doing life saving steps on my on my teammate okay. um but I went through that first time and, you know, I, I told myself that, I told myself that, um, you know, there was nothing that I could have done at that point in time. And so like, I had to forgive myself in order to move on. And so did so, you put the blame at first on yourself for that happening? You know, there's a little survivor's guilt that goes on with that. You know okay. what I mean? Um, and then, you know, having a, you know, having a job where your primary your primary objective is to bring everybody home alive and you don't yeah automatically gonna feel like a failure you know what i mean so um and so like i had to overcome that um aspect and i did that i did that around 2016 so i like i said i haven't had any issues with that lately um the most of my mental health issues that, that that stem from are are just um being being who i was my whole life you know that stubborn head down um you know just use just use sheer reckless abandon i would say you know what i mean just tune everything out make yourself numb do the work and so like you know eventually you you can do that for so long and you wear yourself out and i literally did that my whole life military life all that kind of stuff and so i just literally had to tell myself that i was done fighting like I was done fighting myself, you know. I used to have thoughts that um, everybody was plotting against me. Like every interaction that I had, oh, I felt paranoia. Yeah, like people were like, "This guy is telling me this thing," but I know for a fact he's not. That's not his intention. Like I always had this this feeling that people had negative attention uh, intentions against me. Yeah. And so that's that's a horrible way to operate. You know. I I, mean? I, I know the feeling all too well. Like if I was. I guess in a different way, I was high on drugs all the time though. So I get that paranoid feeling. Everyone's out to get me, but really they're not, they're out to help me. They're yeah, trying yeah. to. Yeah. And so, you know, for me, for my natural personality, I like to see the good in people. So not only do I see the good in you, yeah, but I also feel like you're going against me. So that's very conflicting emotions in your head. So I'm battling this on a daily basis. Today and, still, or this is back then? Oh, they, I do. This is like all the time. And so okay. I need to like, get into that. Like I'll tell Jose, like, I just can't right now. Yeah. Anytime I'm in that position, like I, what I've learned that I have to do is just separate myself from everything. So usually before in my life, I would submit myself to hockey or football. Then it was in my job in the military and then it became hockey. So there was always something that I was trying to, you know, hide it with and now I just have to approach those emotions head on and so I've started camping a lot and so I take the nice. time to actually get away process my thoughts embrace my thoughts if I cry out on a camping trip I cry out on a camping trip but there's a lot of questions and there's a lot of emotions and there's a lot of scenarios that I built in my head that I need to be by myself in order to kind of figure that out and, you yeah. know so I write all those things down and so um I felt that, you know, just trying to map my thoughts into a more healthier way has helped me tremendously. Now I realize that I don't have to train as hard. You know, before, 
two years ago, I was training eight hours a day and I wasn't getting the amount of results that I was getting because they were just put your head down, go through the motions kind of workouts where now yeah, like to sweep I'm, it under the carpet sort of yeah, thing. Now I'm mentally rested. I'm a jet. I have my goals are, are very objective oriented. And so I hit those micro goals. And so I move forward. And so by doing that, it raises the positivity. And so instead of thinking negative about myself, I can give myself positive affirmations now. Like Ralph, you said you wanted to do this. You did it now at this point. Yeah. Let's go. You did it. Now let's make another goal and keep pushing it. So that's kind of how I do, I've been able to deal with all those dark moments. Okay, nice, man. That's amazing, guys. I got a couple, three different questions, just random questions I like to end off with, just have some fun. But uh, so hopefully you don't mind. There's three random questions. Everyone gets asked the same ones, but <laughs> so I'll go Jose first. What's your go-to order at your favorite hometown restaurant? And what restaurant is it? Favorite hometown restaurant? Yeah, what's your favorite, your go-to order? Man, I think my favorite hometown restaurant would be a taco truck in Los Angeles for uh, carne asada tacos. I'll stick with that. That's nice, name. man. Nice. <laughs> uh, and what are you curious about right now? In what am I oh, I'm definitely curious about what the future holds, for sure. Fair enough. And is there anything I should have asked but didn't? No, I think we're good, brother. Ralph, what about you? What's your go-to order at your favorite hometown restaurant? Home? We're talking hometown? Yeah, or I'm wherever, I guess. doesn't matter. I'm going to go hot pastrami from Busy Bee. <laughs> nice, man. Is that, that's in Los Angeles? That's in San Pedro. Oh, nice. Shout out Busy Bee. Busy Bee sandwiches. They've been doing the same <laughs> thing for years. They only accept cash. <laughs> nice. That's awesome, man. He, those are the best places, man. I love those he said, places. He said, if it ain't broke, why fix it? <laughs> exactly. What are you curious about right now in this instant? Um, currently, just, you know, the situation that we're in, you know, like, um, you know, we can only take it day by day. And so that's how I'm doing it. But, you know, you yeah, kind so of many unknowns out there for sure. There's so many unknowns. And so you kind of just, I would like to know, you know, a time frame, you know, like a legit <laughs> time frame, like, hey, expect to come back during this day. Yeah. Or whatever. But since the information out there is just so scattered about, it's like not knowing is, is. And that's why and I stopped paying any, attention. We didn't get any COVID-19 questions. <laughs> no, because you know what? I don't care to talk about that shit. <laughs> I hear enough about it from my prime minister and your president. So, <laughs> exactly. It's but I've like honestly, that. over time, like I've just learned to shut out all the negative on the social medias and stuff. Like I really, you know, just broke down and it's like, all right, I gotta put block this, block that. I blocked all the negativity because I was sick of it at the beginning of this whole pandemic. Like. Yeah. Just so much people, like you really it's started to see other people's true colors, good and bad at the beginning. I don't know about you guys, but myself, I really started to see like people I knew really well, their true colors, good and bad, you know? So oh, for sure. For <laughs> sure. But yeah. And is there anything else I should have asked, but didn't to you, Ralph? Um, no, I thought it was, it was great. All right. I appreciate that you guys coming on and thankful for you to get you guys on and stuff like that. Hope you guys have a good rest of your day. Yeah, for sure. Awesome. Thanks, Chris, for having us. Thank yeah, you. thank you very much.